Okay. I know it's been a long while. I had been on a break for about three months because I was dealing with something, and now I am back. And I uh, wanted to make this video based on a question I've been asked for the past one week by all my juniors. Ki, hello, Sriya. How do we do lab diagnosis in micro? And I am sort of tired of answering to them individually, which is why I'm going to make a video. <laughs> So um, I've noted down a couple of points that really helped me um, deal with micro lab diagnosis. So the thing is with microbiology, lab diagnosis is the most important part. No matter how well you know the disease or the organism, if you're not able to diagnose what that organism is, how do you plan on treating them, right? Which is why they emphasize a lot on lab diagnosis and a lot of your marks also depend on that. The first and the most important thing is the understanding of what this lab diagnosis is going to do and why is it being done. The thing is, the moment you understand something, you eliminate the process of memorizing it. Let's just take an example of PCR versus RT-PCR. Once you understand the difference between them, you will realize that reverse transcriptase PCR is used for RNA viruses. So you won't make the mistake of writing just PCR for the lab diagnosis of an RNA virus. Another thing is just understanding the disease in general. Let's assume COVID-19. Once you know the effects of COVID-19 on the human body, you will realize that it releases a lot of D-dimers. And now this can be used as a basis of laboratory evaluation. The same thing goes for things such as aerobic organisms versus anaerobic organisms. Once you learn the concept behind Gaspar jar, Robertson cooked meat broth, etc., you will then realize why they're used for anaerobic organisms. And for you to learn all of this, it's important that you pay visit to a chapter known as general bacteriology, laboratory diagnosis, etc, etc from I think Apur Apurva Shastri. I've read that book. Okay. So when I wasn't able to really cope up with all the lab diagnosis, I went back to the most initial basic chapter of what each and everything really means. Once you do that chapter really well, once you have a great understanding of it, within seconds, if you if you're given an organism, you're at least able to differentiate if it's gram-positive, gram-negative, aerobic, anaerobic, if it's a bacteria or a virus. And once you do that, you have a basic set of format for lab diagnosis that you need to follow for each one of them. Let's take bacteria for example. What I do is if any bacteria is given, I have around 10 criteria and I'll try to see if I remember anything from those 10 criteria and then write my answer. For your reference, I've also linked my answer papers of uh, second year in my bio so do go through them to see how I've written life diagnosis I would suggest go through my pre-university papers because I've gotten better there yeah so for general bacteria you start with specimen collection what specimen do you collect how do you collect it and if it's sputum then where do you collect it how much of sputum do you collect etc etc after specimen collection it's the transport of specimen, which varies for aerobic and anaerobic. After specimen collection, it's direct microscopy. Direct microscopy, mostly in bacteriology, it's gram staining, Albert staining, acid fast staining, etc. Some organisms have specific staining like dark, uh, what is that? Face contrast, dark field microscopy for spirochetes and everything. Once you realize that most bacteria have either gram or this, it's very easy to write your answer. Another part of direct detection is antigen detection. This antigen, you're not taking it from the serum. You're taking it directly from the clinical specimen. For example, immunochromatography, latex agglutination, all of these techniques are used to detect antigen within the clinical specimen. So these are the things that you can mention under direct detection. That is microscopy, antigen detection. Culture. Culture ke liye culture media, culture and methods. What really helps again is reading that first chapter because once you know what makes these culture media different, you can easily recognize the organism that, in, that they can be used for. For example, let's take chocolate agar. Since it's heated, RBCs are lysed and all their contents come out. And because of that, the agar is more nutritious to grow fastidious organisms. Fastidious is the organisms that take time to grow or difficult to culture. And examples of that is Haemophilus influenzae, which is why chocolate agar is used for Haemophilus influenzae. Once you learn the concept, you don't have to memorize. As simple as that. Once culture is done, it comes to identification. Identification, you have biochemical identification. I'm sure you've read catalase positive, oxidase negative, this and that. Unfortunately, I haven't learned a trick how to memorize this. I used to remember it as CPON, CPON, 
Copo, something like that for Kathalie is positive, all three is negative. So, I mean, that's on you. I, I really don't know how to do it even now. Um, but there's again uh, a standard answer of automated uh, methods of uh, identification, Malditoff, Vitek. After identification, you go for antibiotic sensitivity testing. You know the methods, still suggest go to the first topic and read the methods so that you completely have an understanding of how the dilution method takes place, etc. Once this is done, the last two very important ones, serology and molecular testing. Now, serology ke liye antigen detection and antibody detection. Iska you start reading each of the organism and you'll figure out that a few organisms have IgM capture. You'll figure out that a few organisms have uh, specific antibodies and specific antigens that can be detected in the serum. For example, dengue may you can detect NS1 antigen. These are the important points. So once you have these subheadings ready, all you have to do is fill in these subheadings for each organism. And it becomes so easy. Molecular may mostly it's just PCR. You just apply the same to parasites, viruses and fungus. Fungus may the only thing that changes is SDA and you also see different types of yeast cells and the stain used for microscopy changes. Similarly for parasites, stool microscopy, wet mount and how the eggs look etc is the one that's changing. And finally for viruses what changes is cell culture, isolation techniques etc. So as you realize these 10 subheadings remain the same. And for each class of organisms, there's one thing that changes. Once you remember these 10 subheadings, you can fill it out however you want and still get a few marks. This was about formatting. Uh, another great way of formatting that I did for GIT parasites is make a table. And this I learned from my friend Atish. By the way, this is Atish. And Atish has a link tree wherein he has uh, uploaded his micro notes as well as a lot of PPTs from KMC Manipal. You can access it. I think it's the most useful resource our second years have had until now. So he's made a table for um, each of these parasites because most of the lab diagnosis is the same. All that varies is how the egg looks and its different characteristics. Fourth thing, visual memory eggs diagrams. Okay, so I am big on photographic memory. And if you see most of my answers, along with my lab diagnosis, I've also made a picture for almost each and every lab diagnosis. If there is a gram stain, I draw how the organism looks. If there is a culture media, I draw how the culture media turns out at the end. If for that matter, even for rapid antigen detection, I've drawn the uh, immunochromatography kit. So I feel like when you make diagrams, it makes it easier for the teacher to understand that, okay, this woman knows her shit, right? So I have tried to make it as colorful as possible. So I would say whenever you do lab diagnosis, read the diagrams and what's written under them so that you have a visual memory and you can, uh, you can probably copy the same on your paper. This isn't something you're gonna buy hard within a day. You need repeated revisions. Micro is a subject like that, unfortunately, but you'll get through it. Another thing that really helped is knowing the practicality of things. For example, um, Tuberculosis. Um, you start with uh, acid fast bacilli uh, staining, right? After that, you don't move to culture because culture takes a lot of time. You move to CBNAT. CBNAT helps in recognizing rifampicin resistance, which is more important to you for your treatment rather than having the culture. So my biggest suggestion for micro would be read everything. Remember what's important. When you read everything, you get a lot of idea and a lot of concept that's going to help you in Viva and much more in a lot of pra practical application throughout life and even in hospital. Which is why try reading everything, but you don't have to remember everything. That is for sure. I think I've covered all my points. <laughs> I'm gonna close my book. So yeah, that's about it. All the best for your exams. Whoever's gonna be giving their exams, second year finals, second sessionals, whatever it is. Um, I hope this video really helped everyone. I will come back with a vlog when I'm feeling up to it, but I'm hoping that soon. See you.